Military conscription's about to make a comeback, boys. That is if the conservatives win the general election in the United Kingdom. Currently, as it stands, if they win, apparently it's been put on the table that 12 months of mandatory national service is gonna be reintroduced. Now, this is something that the current prime minister, uh, Rishi Sunak, I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak. He introduced this idea that, hey, look, if we if we take the general election, I want to reintroduce national compulsory service. What that means is that it's like everybody would have to serve everybody between whatever given age and whatever given age. They would have a certain amount of time to register once they hit probably 18 more than likely, and they would have to serve a certain amount. Let's talk about who Rishi Sunak is. He used to be the Secretary of the Treasury from 24 July 2019 to 13 February 2020, and he's parliamentary undersecretary of state at the Ministry of Housing, Communities, and Local Government from 9 January 2018 until 24 July 2019. He went to Winchester College and studied politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford University. He was also a Fulbright Scholar at Stanford University in the United States, where he studied for his Master's of Business Administration. Nerd. As far as a political career is concerned, Rishi was elected conservative MP for Richmond, which is York's, in May of 2015 and served as a parliamentary private secretary at the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy from June 2017 until his ministerial appointment. Now, he's publicly stated that he believes bringing back compulsory service across the UK, and the reason why is because he feels that it would foster national spirit that emerged during, you know, the 2020-2021 timeframe. Apparently, the Conservative Party want teenagers to take part in a pilot program for it in 2025 to start it off. They still have to work the details out with the Royal Commission, whoever that is. I'm not sure. I'm not from the UK. I'm, I'm an American. So I just think this is interesting. I think the history of compulsory military service, especially in Great Britain, is very interesting. So let's go back to what They've had compulsory service twice in history so far. Once was during World War I and once was in World War II. In World War I, within one year of Great Britain declaring war on Germany in August of 1914, it wasn't gonna be possible for them to continue relying on volunteers. They needed to conscript people because they couldn't get enough people to go volunteer over to go fight the war in France. Lord Kitchener's campaign, promoted by his famous Your Country Needs You poster, encouraged over one million men to enlist by January of 1915, but it still wasn't enough, especially with the mounting casualties. So the government saw that there was no alternative to increase their numbers except for using conscription, which they used by enacting compulsory active service. In January of 1916, the Military Service Act was passed. This imposed conscription on single men of all ages between 18 and 41. The only folks that were really exempt were the medically unfit, clergymen, teachers, and certain classes of industrial workers. Now, conscientious objectors, which is something that you've probably seen in various films, the one you might think of when you hear about conscientious objectors in war is Hacksaw Ridge, which was about a conscientious objector that fought in the Battle of Okinawa. And that's the only one that, I, that really comes to mind with me, but I'm sure there's plenty of other examples. Even if they were a a conscientious objector, they still could compel them to serve. They just wouldn't put them in combat roles. They put them in like civilian jobs that were supporting the war effort or like non-fighting roles that were at the front, but they were not involved in the fighting. A second act of this passed in May of 1916, which extended conscription to married men. It wasn't including married men at first. The one thing it didn't apply to is it didn't get applied to Ireland because of the 1916 Easter Rising, which I actually did a video previously about. They were like, yeah, we're just gonna, just gonna leave them alone. They're not super happy with us right now. Just gonna leave them alone for this one. Nonetheless, a lot of Irishmen still volunteered to fight in the war. Just to remind you, like conscription back then in World War I even was wildly unpopular. In fact, over 200,000 people protested it in Trafalgar Square during that period time and there was a lot of outrage people were like screaming and yelling and they're just like no i'm not doing that this is horrible this is a terrible idea even though a lot of men failed to respond to the conscription in the first year 1.1 million people enlisted once they got to 1918 they actually raised the limit for conscription up to the age of 51 probably because they lost so much of the nation's youth in the earlier parts of the war between like 1915 and 1917 conscription ended up getting extended until 1920 because they were trying to 
to deal with trouble spots throughout the British Empire and parts of Europe and stuff like that. But ultimately ended up raising conscription resulted in about 2.5 million people joining during World War One. I. I will say everything that I know about the difference between Britain in World War One and World War Two is that they were so against going to World War Two because they lost so many people in World War One. Like Britain suffered such immense casualties in World War One that it was almost everybody was completely against it. One of the things that I've learned over the years is that when Neville Chamberlain, for example, was the prime minister of the United Kingdom prior to World War II kicking off, he was very, very against the war. He was like, absolutely not. We're not getting involved. Obviously, it wasn't an open war at that time, but he's like, we're not going to do anything. I'm not trying to stir the pot when, when they saw stuff going on with Poland and Germany and everything. He was very, very against getting involved. And again, I think that a lot of that goes back to they saw how many casualties they suffered in World War I as a result of everything that happened during that war. So they were like, no, I really don't want to get involved in this. Obviously, that changed when Winston Churchill took over afterwards because he was he was much more pro. We need to do something and we need to do something now or this is going to spread to the United Kingdom. They actually had another conscription during World War II. It was a little bit different. They actually declared war on Germany on the 3rd of September, 1939. And immediately afterwards, Parliament passed a wide-reaching measure, which was called the National Service Armed Forces Act, which imposed conscription on all males aged 18 to 41. Everybody had to register for national service. The same thing goes back to people that were medically unfit, clergymen, teachers, they were they were exempt from it. Other key industries such as like food service workers, farmers, people that were in medicine, engineering, those folks were and en ended up being exempt from it as well. Now, conscientious objectors during this time was a little different. They were actually forced to go before a tribunal and explain their reasons and argue their reasons why they didn't want to join up. If their cases were not dismissed and they didn't get dismissed and allowed to leave, then they were put into non-combat roles similar to the way that it was in World War One. In December of 1941, Parliament passed a second National Service Act. And what it did is it widened the scope of conscription still further by making all unmarried women and all childless widows between the ages of 20 and 30 liable to be called up to go to fight. At the time, men were actually required to do some form of national service up to the age of 60, which included military service for those under 51. The main reason for that was that there were not enough men volunteering for police and civilian defense work or women for the auxiliary units of the armed forces. They've got a big history of this kind of thing happening, but it was only during the two main wars, World War One and World War II, the two great wars. Now, the Labour Party is the other party outside of the Conservative Party in England, and they are saying that this is expected to cost about 2.5 billion pounds, which is a lot of money. Currently, right now, at this very moment, one pound is equal to 1.27 United States dollars, which is actually a lot less than the last time I went there. I think that one pound was equal to two dollars when I went to the UK in 2003, so it's dropped a lot. I haven't actually looked that up in a while. I was kind of curious. You get more bang for your buck if you go to the United Kingdom right now. Yeah, if you want to go on vacation to the UK, now's the time. But in any case, one of the things that they're talking about is the armed forces placements would allow young people to learn about cybersecurity, logistics, procurement, or civil response operations. Non-military volunteering would involve 25 days with organizations such as the fire service and the police. The prime minister specifically said this in reference to the mandatory service idea. He says, this is a great country, but generations of young people have not had the opportunities or experience they deserve, and there are forces trying to divide our society in this increasingly uncertain world. I will bring in a new model of national service to create a shared sense of purpose among our young people and a renewed sense of pride in our country. He also added that this would help young people learn real-world skills and do new things and contribute to their community and our country. Now, the Labor Party has said some things about this that they're, like, obviously super against this. Like I already said, they talked about how it's going to cost 2.5 billion pounds to implement this thing. But they also said, this is not a plan. It's a review which could cost billions and is only needed because the Tories hollowed out the armed forces to their smallest size since Napoleon. Obviously, there's a lot of rich history out there. I don't know everything about the UK's history. I know that there are a lot of political nuances out there that I'm not super savvy on. And I don't think that a lot of Americans are super savvy on, probably because a lot of us probably aren't super savvy on our own politics here in America. So it's hard to be savvy on another country's politics when you're not even savvy on your own. So I'm not going to make any like estimations or guesses on why they're saying these things or who the Tories are. If you want to look up who the Tories are, you're more than welcome to, obviously. Now, interestingly enough, there are actually a number of European countries that already have mandatory service, including Sweden, Norway,
Norway and Denmark. You also have compulsory service in South Korea as well. Everybody has to serve. And also in Israel. Apparently, cuts in the British Army have seen its size fall more than 100,000 in 2010 to around 73,000 as of January 2024. In 14 years, they've lost about 27,000 people in the, the body of the British Army. So just to give you a comparison, as of 2023, the United States Army had 453,551 active duty troops. The U.S. Army also has 325,218 Army National Guard personnel and 176,968 Army Reserve personnel. In total, the U.S. Army has 1,073,200 uniformed personnel and 330,000 civilian personnel, which gives you an idea of how much money we're spending on defense. Obviously, huge yeah. difference, leagues difference from the way that the UK is set up. Obviously, training is very different, everything like that. And the, the amount of money that they have in their budget allocated towards defense, totally different. Like, we are setting enough money aside where we could build, like, X-Wings and TIE Fighters and stuff over here because, you know, we like to be cutting edge, like with our drone technology and things like that. In any case, I'm not sure how the majority of the United Kingdom feels about this, but I would imagine there's probably a lot of division. This isn't, like, a simple thing because 18-year-olds would be able to apply for one of 30,000 full-time military placements or volunteering one week in a month carrying out a community service. That would be part of the plan, but they're not doing that right now. They don't have to right now. That's a huge shift going from not any compulsory service to having mandatory, you have to do some sort of service for the country. I do agree that, yeah, you're probably gonna get a little bit more sense of national pride when everybody's required to serve the military, even if it's only for a brief period of time or only on the weekends, but it is very expensive. A lot a lot of folks may be very turned off by this idea. That could cause further division in their political parties, possibly. But overall, I think that a compulsory mandatory service could probably do some good for a lot of people, even if they don't end up going to war, like when they're serving. I do think that there probably is something to be said about building some sense of national pride. I mean, you see it in, in Israel, for example, they have a very big sense of national pride down there because everybody serves. I mean, I've got a lot of friends down there that serve and I mean, they're everybody's super patriotic super pro their nation, right? I think that it could potentially help us here too. It gives people some sort of a baseline and discipline that maybe they didn't have before. And these are just arguments that, I, that I'm that i making towards it just because I'm biased, obviously, because I serve, right? I do think that getting everybody to the same kind of baseline, you get a better product because people come from all walks of life. Everybody comes from a different place. Some people don't have parents. Some people don't have money. Some people grow up in poverty. Some people grow up rich. Some people don't have any good mentors in their life and maybe this would be a way to kind of like level the playing field so that everybody gets out and they're a better citizen for it and they're you know a better representative or ambassador to their nation i definitely think that's kind of one of the main goals for military service in the united states you know you take in people from all walks of life you raise them up you teach them how to be good people you teach them morals you teach them discipline you help educate them you help get them prepared for life and whether or not they stay in or they get out the ultimate goal of the military other than just defending the nation and defense of the nation is to make better citizens than they were before they got there. I don't know if this is actually going to happen. It still depends on whether or not they win the general election. I think that this could potentially be a positive thing for them. I don't know. I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. If you think this is like a terrible idea or if you think like, hey, maybe this could have some benefits to it. You know, maybe there are some benefits that that could end up helping some people. That's just my opinion. Obviously, I'm not perfect. I don't know everything and I don't have the answer to this, but I'd love to hear what everyone else has to think. So anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and let me know what you think about this in the comments below. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.